Hi, I'm Sarah Tilly from Curious Maths. In this video, we're going to be looking at the formal written method of long division with remainders. Now in England, children start learning about long division in year six. They do it alongside short division, which they've learnt in previous years. Um, but actually, they also have to be able to interpret a remainder and understand what it is in different contexts. So if it's your child's first experience of using long division, I do recommend you look at my other video first, which is long division without remainders. It's definitely the best place to start, ensuring your child has got whole number answers. So if they're ready to move on from that, then it's time to look at long division with remainders. And in this video, we're going to look at some examples and we're also going to consider which remainder is appropriate in which context. So how children interpret the remainders that they find. Right, let's have a go at this question. 7,384 divided by 16. And we're going to solve it using long division. And we'll know it's long division because it's going to be long down the page. It's like the longhand version. So as I've done with all of the division before, I'm using a partitioning grid. And we use this for short division when that was first introduced. Uh, we also used it for long division without remainders. And I'm going to keep using it because, as I've said before, it's a really good way of getting your child to write all the multiples down and calculate them quickly, but also mentally. It's really good for their mental calculation instead of moving to a short multiplication method. And the other main reason is that it doesn't slow the process down. It keeps the flow going. So once they're learning that method, it doesn't sort of interrupt. So by the time children get to this type of question, which is going to have a remainder, then I'm not using the short division reference. So in my first video about long division with no remainders, I was using the short division method alongside the long division method. And the idea really there is to connection make with your child and give them that confidence that they can solve it. And this is just a different way of writing it. And I've always found that by doing it that way, it helps them remember more. But by this stage, I'm assuming that they've got a concrete understanding, a good understanding of long division and the process of long division, i.e. what they have to do and when they have to do it. Um, that I'm not going to do that reference. So we're going to be thinking mostly about the remainders. So I'm just going to finish my partitioning chart just to remind you how to use it. So I've partitioned the 16 into the tens and the ones. And what that enables me to do is multiply them easily mentally. And then I recombine them or add them together. And this column is my total. So I'm just going to do the last few to remind you how to do it. So six tens are 60, six sixes are 36 add them together, we have 96. Seven tens are 70, seven sixes are 42, add them together, we have 112. Eight tens are 80, eight sixes are 48. So with a question like this, I'd be encouraging your child to add 20 from the 48 to the 81st to make 100, and then they've got 28 left really easy way of doing it. And finally, nine tens are 90 and nine sixes are 54. And I do a similar strategy there. So add that 10, add a 10 from the 54 to the 90 to make 100, and you've got 44 left. So it's 144. So now we've got those derived, we can get straight on to the long division. So how many 16s in seven? Zero. So we look at the next digit, we put them together. How many 16s in 73? So we can use our chart. We don't need to stop to do a short multiplication. And we can see that five 16s are 80, which is too many. So it must be four 16s and four 16s are 64. And we take that away. And we can either use a column subtraction method or encourage your child to look at it and calculate mentally. I know that the difference between 64 and 74 is 10. So the difference between 64 and 73 must be nine. Now I bring my next number down. I've used these two. I bring my eight down. How many 16s in 98? Let's use the partitioning chart. I can see that six 16s are 96. So I put my digit six there, six 16s are 96. And I subtract to leave a difference of two. Then I go to my final number. 
going to bring that down. How many 16s in 24? Well, one 16 is 16, two 16 is too many. So it must be one 16. And I write the 16 underneath there and I take it away. So I can count up to find my answer. So 16 to 20, I've added four. 20 to 24, I've added another four. My difference is eight. Now, with all the earlier questions we did with no remainder, we always got a zero and we were always heading to zero. With remainders, we are still heading for zero, but sometimes we can't get there. So as you can see, I've got eight remaining, but I need to put them into groups of 16 because I'm dividing by 16. So I can't share, if I'm thinking about a whole number answer, I can't share that equally. So if it was balls, let's say there were 7,384 beach balls shared between 16 people, they'd have 461 each and there'd be eight left over. And we represent that with an R, either small or big, depends what your child's school does, and we put remainder eight, and that's how we represent it. And the key to this is your child understanding that as soon as they get down to a number smaller than 16, then it's always gonna be the remainder. Now let's have a look at how we represent that remainder as a fraction. So here it is represented as a whole number, remainder eight. For a fraction, it's very simple. All we need to do is we take our divisor, the number we've been dividing by, and make that our denominator. And we put our remainder on the top as our numerator. So our answer becomes 461 and 8 sixteenths. Now I'd expect a year six child to simplify 8 sixteenths and recognize that you can divide it down. If you divide them both by eight, we get a half. So the answer would be represented 461 and a half. And it is really worth noting here that we don't write the R for remainder because the actual remainder is eight whole things. What we've done here is we've shared those eight whole things. So let's think about cakes, for example. If there were 7,384 cakes shared between 16 people, they could have 461 and a half each. We wouldn't put remainder half because that would be incorrect. The remainder is eight, but we could cut those eight up into halves and everybody could have a half. So we use the remainder um, with a fraction quite often when we're talking about things that being cut up or split up or could be shared. We leave our whole number remainder for things that can't be cut up. Now let's have a look at a decimal remainder. We've got a whole number remainder, we've got our fraction remainder, and now we do our decimal remainder. So the first thing that we do is we put a decimal point in and we can put one or two zeros after that decimal point. Now by putting the decimal point in and putting the zero here, we are not changing the value of the number at all. This is still 7,384, but what it does is it gives us a chance to break down our remainder into a decimal form. And sometimes children get a bit panicky when they see this, but actually we follow exactly the same method, um, but we just have a decimal answer. So what we do here is instead of leaving that remainder of eight, we're going to bring that zero down. And that's going to become 80. So how many 16s in 80? Look, there are five 16s in 80. So what I need to do is put my decimal point in my answer. That's really important. And I can represent that five there. And I haven't left myself enough space really, but of course I'm gonna take that 80 away and then I end up with zero. So my answer becomes, 461.5 and we use the decimal representation in a similar way that we'd use the fractional representation so anything that could be split or divided we also use the decimal representation if we were talking about money or measures so for example if this was 7384 pound divided between 16 people they would have 461 pound 50 each. So 
we really encourage the children when they're actually problem solving. So a lot of this will be done through worded problems. We really encourage the ch your child to think about which representation of that remainder makes the most math sense. Where is it sensible to leave the remainder as a whole number? Where should I use a fraction? And just remember that, of course, if we're using a fraction or a decimal, we lose that remainder symbol because we are dividing that remainder up into smaller parts. Let's do another example, 9,225 divided by 36. We're going to use long division and we're going to express the remainder as a whole number, as a fraction and as a decimal. So I've already populated my partitioning. I've partitioned 36 into tens and ones, 30 and six. And so really it doesn't matter which number you're dividing by, your child can use this partitioning method for any number. Um, they can use their three times table to help them do this. So they know two threes are six. So two thirties must be 60 and so forth. OK, so let's start. How many 36 is in nine? Zero. How many 36 is in 92? Let's use our chart. Three 36s are 108. That's too many. We want to keep emphasizing that with your child because that's sometimes the bit they find hard. They don't know when to stop. So in that case, then we must use two. So two 36s are 72. We put the 72 under the 92 and we take it away. Nice and easy. Next, we bring down the number. How many 36s in 202? So we use our chart and we can see that five 36s are 180. So we take that away. And that leaves us 22. So we bring our next number down. How many 36s in 225? We can see that six 36s are 216. So we write that down and we take it away. So 16, 216 to 220 is four plus five more. We've got a difference of nine. So we haven't got any more numbers to bring down and our remainder is fewer than our divisor. So we can now start thinking of that as something that's left over. So as long as it's fewer than 36, we know we can't go any further. And if we need to write a whole number remainder, it would be 256 remainder nine. So if we're going to do a fractional answer, we're going to, we don't even need to rewrite anything here. We can write it as 256. Nine is our remainder, nine out of 36. 256 and nine 36. And I can see there that nine 36 can be simplified. I can divide them both by nine, which is equivalent to one quarter. And I'm always going to use the simplified fraction because it's easier for my brain to understand and take, take the information in. So I will change that now to 256 and a quarter. So that would be an appropriate representation if the problem you were solving was something that could be cut up like cakes or plates, paper plates and things like that. This would be an appropriate number answer if you were talking about people, for example, you, you can't split them up. Right, now let's look at a decimal answer. So if we want a decimal answer, we need to put our decimal point in and at least one zero. And what we do is we simply bring that zero down. So we're continuing with the value, we're continuing to divide. How many 36s in 90? Let's have a look. Two 36, we must put our decimal point in, are 72. Let's take that away. That leaves us with 18. So now we've got 18 remaining. Let's try another zero. Let's see if we can um, get our decimal represented in its most simple form. Let's bring that down. How many 36s in 180? And look, there are five 
36 in 180. I put it there, I subtract it, and I get left with zero. So I know I cannot go any further. So the same answer represented as a decimal is 256.25. And actually, uh, in year five and six, we expect children to know that a quarter is equivalent to 0 0.25. So it might well be that they could quite quickly tell you, well, if it's 256 and a quarter, I know what the decimal representation is. I don't need to write that out. So when you give your child questions, I really recommend giving them several dividing by 36. Because if they've already gone to the trouble of doing the partitioning chart, then actually it really keeps the flow going and gets them to just practice using that one idea. It's a bit like in a science uh, test where you keep a constant. So your 36 would be your constant and that would be really helpful for your child. Do four or five questions. You could um, build on the question quite nicely. So you could say to them, well, what if it was 9,226? divided by 36. What would be my remainder then if I added one more to this value? And you'd be looking certainly for the whole number representation for them to be able to say, well, that would be 256 remainder 10. That would be 256 and 10 36 they might have to do some simplifying. Maybe not so easy to predict the decimal, but actually if you ask some questions like this, you're connection making. So it's really, really gonna help them. So you could also say, what if it was 9,224? 9, what would the answer be then? And would they recognize that it would be 256 remainder eight this time? You could then maybe say, what would be the question that would give the answer 256 remainder seven? So you're really scaffolding, you're really going in depth on one question and getting them to make connections um, and talk through what they're thinking. Here is a summary of the main teaching points. Use a partitioning grid for your child to derive all of those multiples before they even start the long division question. It's a really good way for them to practice their mental calculation and um, derive known facts. And also it actually really helps with the flow so it doesn't slow them down without actually tackling that long division question. Because they've spent a bit of time putting together that partitioning grid, why not use the same divisor for several questions? Instead of jumping around the place, your child could do four or five questions, dividing by exactly the same value. They can use the same grid and it will just make sure that they're really focusing on that new bit of learning. Perhaps it's the remainder that's new, so you really want them to focus on that. When they're thinking about remainders, do really encourage them to understand and explore which remainder would be the best to use. So if you're thinking about problem solving, in what context would the whole number remainder be most useful? Where might we use a fractional remainder and where would a decimal remainder work? So those links to real life are really important and help make sure your child's got that sort of general understanding of division and general understanding of remainders. Mm -hmm.